first of all got started discussing about uh, uh, photonic uh, optical devices and uh, uh, what uh, <coughs> we'll do today is uh, go uh, uh, go deeper into it and look at uh, the basics of uh, uh, materials that are necessary for uh, and materials and the design that is necessary for uh, 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 primarily two kinds of uh, photonic devices uh, uh, and both of them are emitters uh, uh, one will be the light emitting diode or a LED and the other uh, would be the laser a semiconductor laser uh, and uh, uh, we are going to talk primarily about these two devices and the materials that go into it but I think you can imagine that uh, if you kind of run that the, pr uh, the the movie of that all the physical processes backwards it's also a photo detector or a solar cell it's the same similar thing the design requirements are typically slightly different for the photo detector or the solar uh, or the absorbers but we are going to talk about emitters today yes, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, if you look at uh, what are the materials we are going to use, well, uh, uh, not, not a big surprise. The materials are the same as we uh, talked about for transistors. Uh, the, uh, so, so now, uh, we, we, for transistors, we are primarily concerned with the energy band gaps and the band offsets. Uh, for, for lasers and LEDs, we'd obviously also be very interested in the wavelength right? or, or the color of the of the uh, uh, corresponding to that uh, light, right? And so from here, right away, you can see that uh, gallium arsenide-based uh, uh, gallium arsenide or you know indium phosphide-based materials uh, uh, span uh, wavelengths of about a micron or you know about 800 nanometer uh, or moving towards that range, right? So, uh, and you see that as you go above about uh, 800 nanometer, most of these materials, the dashed lines are indirect band gap. They don't, they don't, they are not very good light emitters. Okay? as you go above it. Uh, so, so as a result, uh, uh, so 800 nanometer is kind of the threshold, right, of uh, uh, red, uh, red wavelengths. So, 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 so that's, uh, uh, these are the materials that are used for red uh, uh, LEDs, red lasers, um, and so on. And uh, if you want to make them uh, uh, longer wavelength, then you can obviously go down here and choose the material, right? Uh, so uh, if you look, uh, look at uh, uh, um, say uh, you know indium gallium arsenide based uh, one of the most important wavelengths for telecommunications is 1.55 micron right so we'll see that uh, you know typically uh, indium gallium arsenide or phosphide based uh, heterostructures would be the, the materials that are chosen for uh, 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 powering the entire of you know optical communication industry so, so the, those are the lasers that are, uh, use these materials here and uh, you can see that a 1.55 micron uh, wavelength uh, starts getting, you know, antimonides are not very large substrates are available as far as the materials go. Remember, we had discussed that. Uh, whereas uh, indium phosphide large substrates are available, gallium arsenide large substrates are available. But if you look at 1.55 micron, you know, you are not on top of any of these. You are in an alloy region, typically, in the middle of many things. Therefore, a lot of design goes into into uh, you know the the materials have to be chosen right they have to be grown correctly uh, and and uh, there would be strain and such things that you have to kind of counter uh, in 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 uh, lasers or leds made of them so uh, uh, and then uh, so those are infrared uh, and what you'll see is the whatever i said till now uh, also uh, for visible uh, you obviously go into the nitrides now uh, indium gallium nitride will take you into green uh, and then into blue to violet and all the way to deep ultraviolet. You know? so, so, so those are the nitrides. Right? And remember, these are the band gaps, which means we are talking about uh, uh, an optical transition that uh, uh, is, is uh, happening between uh, the, the conduction band uh, and the valence band, right? So, so these are inter-band transitions. So uh, the, the whole job of a, the device would be made in this way. You first design the device and then you have to inject electrons into the conduction band, right? And you have to inject holes uh, into the valence band. Or in other words, you have to pull out the electrons from the valence band, right? Uh, and then, uh, uh, then they will, uh, uh, you know, this electron will fall into that empty electron state and uh, emit a photon, and that's how, you know, the light emission occurs. So this process will be called uh, interband transition for good reason, right? You're going from one band to another band. 
And remember, do different bands have different, uh, for example, uh, from uh, uh, your uh, tight binding models of semiconductors, you know that these are more S-like states, these are more P-like states, so they have different uh, symmetries and angular momenta and such things like that. Right? So, the, so this is interband transition. Uh, now for very short wavelengths, uh, 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 there is another possibility, uh, sorry, very long wavelengths, uh, very long wavelengths, you know, 10 micron or more. There's another possibility where instead of going into a band, uh, you do inter sub band. And this is one of the, for example, I think that one of the assignment problems you looked at. So, so you can actually affect transitions where you fill this state and this state is empty. It's possible within the same band, within the conduction band, let's say. Yeah. And then the valence band is here, but the valence band is completely full. It has also quantized states, but it's full of, you know, completely occupied. There are no holes there. So, uh, so this is this sort of a transition where all the uh, uh, action happens. You know, the electron uh, drops into another subband and it emits a photon. Uh, this would be called an inter-subband transition, right? Uh, inter-subband optical transition, and uh, 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 the. Uh, what you notice here is uh, the, the uh, we'll see this later, uh, the aspect, so, so here the transitions are allowed, uh, both of them are in the same band, right? So both are like S-like orbitals. So therefore, the transition, so remember something has to be different and, uh, uh, you know, because light has angular momentum and it has to be conserved and such, so it always occurs between uh, uh, you know, or uh, meaning one of the states would be symmetric, uh, is, uh, symmetric, the other would be you know, asymmetric. So it always, so what, one of these things have to happen. Either the bands have, you know, or, uh, wave functions that are, uh, you know, odd and even, uh, or uh, the, uh, um, the, if it's within the same band, then the quantized states have a part of the wave function that's odd and even. Uh, otherwise, this optical transition is not allowed. So, okay, yeah. so we'll see that. So this is uh, really the major, uh, at least till, uh, uh, till today, uh, most of the LEDs and lasers are made using interband transitions. Uh, now here you can see that uh, uh, this, this sort of, uh, it's a very, it will give you some interesting design, uh, uh, design uh, freedom, meaning you are changing the wavelength uh, of light by changing, for example, quantum well width and things like that. You can change it with the same material. You can change that. Here too, you can change it with quantum well width, but here the band gap typically is the dominant one, and then there's a little bit of shift on top of that because of quantum confinement and other things. Here, it's all because of quantum confinement. So, yeah. And uh, so inter subband transition is typically for very long wavelengths till now, so uh, very long wavelength light emitters, and this will be quantum cascade sort of lasers. It's a unipolar device, just one type of carriers, only electrons. There's no need for holes here. Here you need both electrons and holes. So this is a bipolar device. Okay, so uh, bo involves both bands. Here it involves only one band. So, so. Uh, and uh, uh, just as a another point before we uh, delve, uh, you know, into the details, uh, uh, the uh, interband transition. Rough order of magnitude of how, how long it takes for an electron to fall into a whole state is of the order of nanoseconds. It can vary widely, depending on carrier density and all. But you know, rule of thumb of the order of nanoseconds. This this is how long it takes if an, there's an electron there and uh, the hole uh, at the same k, either at the minimum or slightly off, uh, then uh, the transition probability or the transition rate of this one over transition rate is of the order of a nanosecond interband transition. Here it's much faster. You know, Inter-subband is much faster. Uh, would be few picoseconds. Okay? So it's you know, at least 100 times faster or something. Like that. So, uh, so, so those are the major differences between these two sorts of uh, optical transitions. And we are going to look at that in a little more detail uh, now. So whatever I said, as you can imagine, about the band gaps and all that, and you know, the choice of materials applies to this. Interband transition because that's the band gap. Uh, sorry, that's that's the picture of the band gap, and the corresponding wavelengths. Now this all has to do with band offsets. Right? So you got to look at the band offsets and all that sort of thing. So, so that's, that's yeah. Okay, so let's look at uh, the uh, optical transitions just as a quick reminder of uh, we had uh, this kind of started the class <coughs> using this picture. 
uh, uh, that uh, if you take any material, uh, you know, any semiconductor material, and you uh, essentially uh, try to uh, transmit, uh, in light, get, let, pa pa uh, you, you try to pa uh, pass light through it and see how much of it is absorbed, and you can define this absorption coefficient, and we're going to do it quantitatively today as a function of the wavelength or the energy of the photon. Uh, this is this typical spectra, absorption spectra, uh, uh, absorption coefficient spectra. So uh, we are going to first look uh, into, in, at some detail into, uh, so we're going to kind of forget all these other details, optical phonons, you know, valence band to acceptor, all these, you know, lower energy, lower energy uh, transitions, which have to, many of them have to do with either defects, meaning you, instead of interband, you are going from, say, the, you know, acceptor level into the valence band, for example. That's a small energy, right? So, so you have all these little blips which show uh, details of uh, transitions. Uh, then you have the collective optical uh, vibration of the whole whole crystal, uh, which is the optical phonon energy, uh, uh, which uh, uh, you know doesn't quite show up in the band structure because that's this is the electronic band structure, and then you have a phonon band structure, which is we haven't even you know incorporated that in this picture. But all this can be done in a similar spirit, right? So we're going to neglect these things, and uh, we're going to talk briefly about excitons. But really, what we are interested in is this major peak here, you know, interband optical transition, which happens when the photon energy, we are talking about absorption right now, uh, uh, when the photon energy exceeds the band gap. You can see that, that then, then you have optical inter uh, absorption, interband optical absorption. So uh, uh, now, uh, what I want to uh, start with is, uh, uh, we will basically jump right into the uh, device first, discuss the device in some quasi, you know, uh, qualitative or quantitative detail, then we are going to uh, we are going to look at the LED first in some detail, and then uh, let that motivate us to figure out, for example, can I evaluate why is alpha or absorption coefficient of the order of 10 to the power 5? Okay? And we'll see that obviously emission is the you know, inverse of absorption. Right? So, and uh, uh, we'll see that uh, when you can turn absorption coefficient around, uh, have a negative sign on it, then it will emit. Right? So, so, or, or it will have gain, and we are, we're going to look at that. Today, okay? so, yeah. Before you said also that any transition has to happen between an odd and even, like even, say, is that because the angular momentum is always h bar between the of the photon? Yeah, oh. that, and I will show you a little bit more detail uh, because the transition. Uh, uh, so there is, so the, uh, the probability of this transition is dependent on on overlap of the wave functions of the two, you know, initial and final state. And so that's, uh, we're going to look at that uh, in a little more detail today. So it's called the Fermi Golden Rule, which takes you, you know, the photons come in and then they kick out an electron. Whether that happens or not depends on uh, the angular momentum of the photon. The, so basically, that is enforced by all the conservation laws. M momentum has to be conserved, angular momentum has to be conserved, and energy has to be conserved. So all three have to be conserved in the process. That restricts which transitions can occur. So the sum of all conservation laws. Yeah. Uh, I just have a quick question on this chart. Sure. Like, it seems like there is a main peak and then a lot of smaller peaks that come for like, the first three. Uh, you mean? Optical photons and then they don't spend the donors take too much in. There's like, yeah. a lot of peaks. Why, why are they occurring periodically, I guess? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. So. Um, you can have multiple optical phonon modes uh, also. Uh, so there are various reasons. I mean, the, there can be uh, multiple optical phonon modes. It's not necessarily one, only one. So you have uh, transverse optical, longitudinal optical. So there are various modes of, the, of that kind. And the optical phonons can, so you can have multi-particle. So the strongest one is uh, typically very clear. It's you know, LO phonon. Longitudinal optical will be the strongest, typically. Uh, and uh, the other ones are typically, uh, you know, kind of, the, the, they might involve multiple par particles, meaning, for example, it might be combination of optical phonon. Uh, so, so essentially, they, uh, it can be combination of optical phonon and interband, and, and optical phonon and valence band to acceptor, and many of these. So there is many possibilities. There are many possibilities for that. So, so I'm not getting into the detail. Uh, I think that part. Uh, is covered, I think, in a greater detail in Professor Rana's course on semiconductor optoelectronics and you know uh, physics. So, uh, okay. So, 
Right. So uh, let's get into uh, one of the. Uh, so so this picture is from uh, rocket. So what is a uh, LED? Uh, it's basically a PN diode. We have already talked about PN diodes, and uh, uh, both uh, LED and a laser uh, are a PN diodes. So PN uh, heterojunction. Uh, sorry, uh, homojunction or heterojunction. And uh, uh, so essentially, uh, why do we need a PN diode? I already mentioned. If you want interband transition, you need to inject both electrons and holes, right? So and and, and uh, so you N type region where the Fermi level is close to the conduction band is your electron injector, and P type region where the Fermi level is close to the valence band is full of holes. I mean, it's, it has a lot of holes. That's your hole injector into the you know into the region where the recombination will occur. Okay, uh, so. Uh, uh, in a PN diode, uh, we had discussed briefly about uh, some of the processes that occur that lead to the total current. And uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, you know, just let's just uh, jog our memory a little bit and and uh, say that uh, uh, when I have applied a forward bias to a PN diode, uh, I've chosen a semiconductor here uh, and another here, uh, and I've applied a certain forward bias. Uh, what what is the forward bias? Well, I have two Fermi levels. I've tied these, uh, made ohmic contacts to both, and I've applied, uh, uh, you know, on the P side a positive bias, and, and on the N side a negative bias. So I've applied a voltage across it. So, and, and, and that's why you have, you know, initially the Fermi levels were aligned, and now because of the voltage, it has split. Right. So it has split, and this splitting, uh, so far away from the junction, it kind of goes back to where it was. Uh, you know it's equilibrium, but uh, but within this region, uh, there is uh, uh, the splitting deep inside the depletion region is uh, uh, basically Q times whatever voltage you have applied. You know? so, so that's that's. The, so if you have applied you know two volts, then this is two electron volt splitting, of the two. So, uh, you know basically uh, this terminal of the battery is in equilibrium with the n electrons in the n side. And uh, uh, this side of the battery is in equilibrium with the Fermi level of the P, P side, and uh, uh, so so uh, because the battery, the two ends of the battery are out of equilibrium by each other by two volts, so it's two EV. Just transfers there directly. Uh, so now, um, so in this region, your uh, let's label these conduction band edge, valence band edge, and uh, uh, this is your. Uh, let's call it F sub n, quasi Fermi level of electro uh, n on the n side. Uh, this is your F sub p or quasi Fermi level on the p side. I think E F p and all that. I mean, I'm just going to use F here. Uh, and and uh, uh, so in this region, uh, you have a splitting. And if you remember, uh, what we had written was n times p in, inside a semiconductor is always n i squared. Uh, so at equilibrium, it is n p is equal to n i squared. But the moment you have applied a voltage, you pulled it out of equilibrium now, right? So remember that's why we introduced e to the power, you know, f n minus f p over k t. That's that was the equation. N times p is equal to that relation. Right? So so if I look at you know this little slice of the uh, semiconductor region here, you can see that n times p in this little window here is n i squared times e to the power q v by k t right and it's so you have exponentially more you know uh, uh, carriers in this region than equilibrium right? uh, and uh, how much more it's e to the power q v by k t more right? so for example if you apply 2 volts it's it's huge you can see e to the power you know uh, 2 e v over 0 0.026 EV is a it's a huge number, very large. So 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 as a result, what you have done is in the depletion region, inside the depletion region where most you know much of this action is happening, you have jacked up your electron density and hole density way more than what it was before. Right? So so what will the system do? I think it's very clear. It it will try to get rid of excess carriers. It is out of equilibrium. Every system wants to go back to equilibrium. And it has to go back to equilibrium. So, how much excess carriers does it have? It's NP minus NI squared, right? That's the excess carriers because at equilibrium is that, at non equilibrium is that, right? So, so that is just NI squared times E to the power QV over KT minus 1, 
right? You can see it starts looking like a diode. I mean, diode equation. But anyway, that's the kind of the excess carrier density product. It's not each carrier density, but the product of the two. Right? So it looks like that. And and uh, uh, so uh, let me just say so so how can it get rid of these carriers? Obviously, there are many processes. No matter what process you are going to look at, it has to recombine. Electrons have to drop into electron states have you know have to drop into empty states here and get rid of that energy by any way me, any means possible right and there are two classes of uh, processes that can happen one is it uh, it drops here and it emits a photon right? and the other is it drops basically what happens is maybe there are some defects and other things or it has phonons so essentially it uh, first drops into a defect state Maybe it has some subband gap emission, or that energy is lost because of a cascade of phonons or heat vibration. So, so no matter what we look at, there are two processes that can occur. One is going to be radiative, which will emit light. The others, which will be related to defects, so essentially uh, holes can get captured, electrons can get captured. The second process will be non-radiative, and that's that's uh, you can obviously classify that any process in which photons are not coming out. Is a non-radiative process, and the end result of pretty much all non-radiative processes is heat. It's going to end up heating. So, so yeah. meaning it can go through a couple of processes where it's collective phonon vib vibrations, but then in the end it gets dissipated as heat, and it's it typically becomes irre irre irrecoverable. You can't get it back. I think you have learned about entropy and all that because it goes into way too many modes. You can't get it back anymore. Right? When it goes into light or radiation. It goes into a particular wavelength or a bunch of wavelengths, and you can kind of light is recoverable. You can reharness it. You can convert it back into some energy. But once it converts to heat, it's harder to get it back. Much harder. So, yeah. Okay. So radiative and non-radiative processes. Typically, uh, the radiative process you can see right away, uh, uh, or rather, uh, for the radiative process to occur, uh, let's write it this way: radiative recombination rate. Uh, Okay, so so I'm not. I was going to write. Pro, first of all, you can see the radiative recombination rate will be proportional to this thing here, right? It will be proportional to NP minus N squared because if you haven't pulled out, uh, pulled it out of equilibrium, there's no reason for radiation at all, right? So it's. Uh, does that make sense? There is. Uh, so so uh, radiative recombination requires electrons and holes. So therefore, the radiative recombination rate is proportional to n times p right away. Actually, n, t, n times p minus n i square. But I think you see why I'm neglecting the, you know, one here because this is so large that you know you can just throw that out, right? Uh, so it's proportional to n, I, n times p. But then there are a couple of other terms which I am not going to derive in this course. You know, that is done in a semiconductor physics or a solid-state physics or, of course, our optoelectronic devices course. Anyway, so uh, there are some terms. There's a thermal velocity which kind of indicates how fast are electrons or what are the velocity of electrons because they need to kind of find whole states or empty states to fall into. And, and uh, there is a material parameter here which uh, de depends on the band gap and you know, things like and effective masses and all that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. so this is from your book from Rocket. So, but my main point here is it is proportional to n times p, radiative recombination. Midpoint here. Right. And uh, typically, the way it will be written is uh, uh, it will be written as b times n times p. You know? So, so the, 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 all the coefficients are clubbed together as a parameter called b. And I think you can see in a PN diode uh, uh, in this uh, region. Let's assume for for now that these are uh, this is a homojunction and kind of a relatively similar p and n doping levels. So I think you will agree with me that n and p will be close to each other, it's close to n. In fact, it's actually a for optical transition they're exact. They have to be exactly. I mean, they're exactly equal in some sense. Right? I mean, for every photon that comes out, you took away one electron and one hole. Right? So 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 it's uh, so it becomes uh, this way. Radiative recombination is b times n squared. That's what it becomes. Now the non-radiative parts. Uh, Non-radiative. Uh, uh, so, so for example, if it is defect-assisted, uh, so there's a defect, let's say, and the electron gets captured by emission of photons, and then just gets captured here, uh, and the holes, maybe you know, there are many defects. The holes also get captured, but you see whether an electron gets captured or a hole gets captured really doesn't depend on the presence of the other. So it's a kind of a single particle process. 
uh, this sort of non-radiative part. So therefore, this is proportional to n. It doesn't depend on n times p. It's proportional to n. Right? So the non-radiative part due to defects, and it has a coefficient of a. This is, I'm, I'm giving you, actually it's very correct. When you make LEDs later, these are the things you have to find. A, what's your A, what's your B, and all that sort of thing. There's another non-radiative process, which is related to OJ, uh, uh, which is a three particle, uh, you know, it's kind of the inverse of impact ionization that we had talked about. Uh, uh, let me just sketch it out, what it means. Uh, so, um, or rather, I, I'll not draw the band structure, I'll draw it in terms of the band diagram. So. Uh, what you have is an electron here and a hole here, and we are finding all ways, it's also non-radiative, in which it can re recombine and not emit a photon, give its energy to something else. Right? That's, what we're, that's a non-radiative process. So if you remember, one of the processes we looked at when there was very high fields is when an electron collides with another electro, uh, sorry, elect uh, electron in the valence band and kicks it out right, and creates a hole, and then there are two electrons and one hole, and then they multiply. This was the avalanche process. right? So it's kind of the somewhat the inverse of that process is called OJ. So, so what can happen here is, uh, uh, so there are lots of say electrons, uh, and uh, 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 so instead of recombining with this, what can happen is this electron and this electron collide in the conduction band, right? and uh, so essentially this gets kicked out, uh, and and uh, uh, so essentially this energy of re so it falls into this state. But that energy is not does not go out as a light or a photon. It 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 is imparted in kicking another electron out, and then that electron cascades down with phonon emission. So that's called OJ process. It's a three particle process, so it requires two electrons and one hole. In this picture I just drew. Does that make sense from what I just in a simple picture? So this particular OJ process would be typically have a label of CCH. All that it means is conduction band, conduction band, and valence band or hole band, you know, CCH process. And this will be proportional to, I think you can guess it, it's going to be proportional to n squared times p. Because it needs two n's and one p. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. And you will have a similar in, uh, other process if you have way more holes, then there will be a p square n or something like that. No matter what, you can see that the OJ pro process will be, uh, 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 so uh, let's call it due to defects yeah, and, and, and uh, so non-radiative because of OJ. I think you can see uh, that uh, uh, this will be proportional to n cubed, you know, right? It's n squared times p and let's say p and n are equal, so this will be c times n cubed. So, so these are the, now the important difference between the one due to non-radiative to defects and the ones OJ is you can make your material as pure as you want and reduce all the defects, right? But you can't get rid of this, right? Because this doesn't involve defects, actually. So, so this is an intrinsic non-radiative process, intrinsic to the material. Right? So, uh, um, okay. So uh, now you combine it, uh, and you see that uh, when you combine this story now, uh, what is defined as the, uh, as the uh, internal uh, quantum efficiency uh, of, of a radiative process let, let me write it down here. Internal uh, quantum efficiency of radiative process uh, is defined as uh, the ratio of radiative to, non -ra uh, to the total, total radiative process. So what fraction of these, you know, uh, uh, of the uh, recombinations ends up becoming light? That's what you know, radiative is the internal quantum efficiency. Or in other words, if I inject 100 electrons and 100 holes, how many of them, uh, how many photons did I get out? That's internal quantum efficiency, the fraction of that, right? And from here you can see that it will be basically the radiative part would be in the numerator, right? B n squared. And in the denominator will be the sum of everything, radiative plus non radiative, right? So, so, so you will have uh, A n plus B n squared C n cubed. Right? So, so that's what you're going to get, and that's your internal quantum efficiency. And uh, uh, so, so the game in uh, making an LED or a laser would be to first uh, maximize your internal quantum efficiency. And the IQE in most modern LEDs and lasers is close to 95, 99 percent. I mean, 
material quality has to be very good. If IQE, you start with like 5%, it's a you know, very low efficiency to start with. I mean, because IQE is not the only thing in the, in the light emission uh, LED process, because you, once you emit the light, you need to get it out. I mean, there are many other things involved. Uh, but this is one factor which, by, by very careful material science and engineering of the device structure and all that, you can engineer it to be maximum, so, so, maximize it. And I think it's pretty clear what you need to do. You just need to obviously cut this down and cut that down, right? So the non-radiative parts and maximize the radiative part. So, so that's really the game. Uh, okay, so uh, is that clear? Yeah. So how controllable is, like, C, for example? Right, very good point. So C is, uh, mm, let me uh, first uh, say that uh, uh, for narrow band gap semiconductors, uh, the C is very high. C is very high for narrow band gap semiconductors. If you are looking at very narrow gap materials, band gap semiconductors, the C is high. And I think you can probably kind of see why, because once the gap is small, you, you know, uh, this energy of transition is, uh, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, uh, so if I look at two situations where, and I'm looking for OJ, I think maybe pictorially you can see that if the gap is very large, it will be very hard for an electron to find another state out there, you know, if the gap is large, because uh, it basically it's a density of states argument. So for narrow gap materials, the OJ coefficient is very high, and therefore OJ effects kick in very, uh, you know, uh, at uh, significantly lower carrier injection densities than with wider band gap semiconductors. And uh, uh, how controllable is it? Uh, let me put it this way. It's actually rather difficult to control, the OJ effect. It's, it's rather difficult to modify. There are some tricks, but uh, uh, it's rather difficult to fight against. So typically, you'd be uh, um, designing the device, taking that into account. Uh, you can do some sort of quantum confinement and reduce the, you know, basically if you restrict states available there uh, for this electron to get kicked up to, into, then, then you will be able to reduce the OJ process. So, yeah. uh, Leon, have a question? No. Okay, yeah. uh, so uh, I think from units, you can kind of figure out what would the units, well, this is one over centimeter six, carrier density square is one over centimeter six, therefore, and the rate is one over second, so this will be, you know, of units of uh, centimeter six over seconds. I think you can kind of figure it out if you read papers or something like that, this, this is the reason for units. And, uh, you know, the numbers look crazy, but essentially it will be, uh, all of them will multiply to give you of the order of a nanosecond here in the tau, okay, in a one over tau. Therefore, you can figure out that if you have a carrier density of 10 to the power 17 or something like that, I'll be looking at, you know, say 10 to the power 6, minus 16 or something, whatever, you know, the order of magnitude of these ABCs. Similarly, Cs would be 1 centimeter uh, uh, 9, right? I mean, it's cubed here, so it'll be N is 1 over centimeter cubed. So it will have accordingly the right units for it. Okay, so uh, let's look at now the... Uh, 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 details of it. So clearly what we are going to see is we don't want to use just a homojunction. You can do wonders by going one extra step and I'll actually get to that in, uh, very soon. Let me just uh, uh, summarize a couple of things. So uh, is that clear? So this is typically the picture you have here, right? And you have uh, light emission uh, uh, and, uh, and then the structure would be, you know, you grow the material. This is the epitaxial 3-5 semiconductor and then it's packaged in a way you know, light would typically kind of come out as a cone or a funnel. I mean, your quant uh, we'll see that we'll put quantum wells. I mean, these days, uh, there are typically no homojunction LEDs. It's all heterojunction with, uh, you know, quantum wells and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, here is your, say, you know, P contact and the backside is your end contact. And it's packaged with a lens and all that. I mean, it depends on the application. You know, if you're looking at the iPhone, there is no lens like that. I mean, it's, yeah, so, so it depends on the application. So there's a base and all that stuff. It's, uh, all right, so let's look at some, some detail uh, specifics. So I think uh, I'm just reusing this slide. Uh, uh, so this is an example of a LED structure where uh, you have N-type. This is a nitride LED, gallium nitride, and you have P-type on top and P-type positive voltage and negative voltage on the N-type, and you're injecting electrons and holes, except the only thing that's different here is in this region, there are three quantum wells injected three quantum wells injected, uh, rather, sorry, three quantum wells that have been grown, and, uh, uh, and then they 
basically holes inject, electrons inject, and out comes the light. And here's some pictures. Again, I mean, I uh, uh, please read this article. I'll actually post it on the web too. It's also kind of nice. What it shows is, uh, you know, the idea of LEDs have the first LEDs were made in 19, late 1960s, uh, uh, and the first uh, operational LEDs were made by Nick Holoniak, who's uh, just about retired now at uh, Illinois. Uh, he was in General Electric. They, they made the first uh, uh, arsenide phosphide-based LEDs at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, now visible uh, LEDs are now uh, moving to green and blue. I mentioned earlier because of the band gap, you're looking at nitrides now. Here's an, you know, just as obviously a cartoon schematic. Uh, P-type, N-type, uh, you, you can see that there are many uh, interesting engineering things you have to do because light is going to come out, you can't cover the whole thing with a metal contact, you know, because you, you, then it will reflect the light back. So you have only, you know, basically a LED will have contacts like this and then it will have all these arms or things like that to let light go out, you know, so go out, otherwise it gets reflected and such. Uh, and uh, uh, Okay, so, so let's look at, uh, so uh, typically what happens is the uh, LED that uh, produces light at the wavelength at which the, you have designed the quantum wells, it will you know, emit light at that wavelength. But many times what happens is you don't want that wavelength, you want some other wavelength from the light. Many times that's what happens. And, then, and uh, uh, so, so this is just the you know, homo junction and we are going to now see why we want to put the petro junction in there. I already talked about this, it's the internal quantum efficiency, you want to maximize it. And uh, if we look at a lot of the LEDs that are, uh, you know, if, you're, if you go to the store today and buy a white LED, obviously, you know, there is no such thing. I mean, uh, white is a mixture of many colors, right? And the way it's made is you typically would be looking at a blue LED, and then on, on top of it in the casing, you know, there will be all these nanocrystals or quantum dots or dyes that have a down conversion, meaning it will absorb a blue down converted into some, some amount of green. You know? and some amount of red. So white being a mixture of many colors, you create this sort of a mixture of many colors, uh, many phosphors. Uh, typically it's a yellow phosphor, which uh, uh, down converts into a yellow wavelength, and by the right mix of blue and yellow, you can get a very nice white spectrum. So, so uh, and then that's what's used. Uh, and uh, the, in, the internal quantum efficiency of the phosphors is close to 100%, I mean 99.9%. So every photon that comes in, basically gives you a photon at a smaller energy or a longer wavelength. Always longer, not shorter. I mean, because it cannot up-convert the energy, it down-converts it. Make sense? Yeah. And, uh, but you know that when you have a phosphor, you're going to lose some energy because you're down-converting and that part of the energy is lost. Does that make sense? You go from, say, uh, uh, 2.5 EV to 2.3 EV or something like that and that little slice is lost. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, obviously, one way, another way to make that is if you have different active regions with, which are emitting at different wavelengths, that's another way to make the same device. But you can see it gets more complicated now, right? So, so, and, and such things. Okay. So, uh, so this is typically used, in fact, if you look at all the, uh, you know, traffic lights today, uh, which are, the green traffic lights are actually blue LEDs, uh, which have been coated with green phosphors. You know, so. Um, uh, the reason for that is the blue LED has a higher total efficiency than the green LEDs uh, today. So, uh, so, so they use the blue. Even after down conversion, your net efficiency is higher you know, than if you had started with the green. And that is a material challenge too. I mean, why, why is the green LED efficiency lower? So uh, just to summarize uh, the, the, uh, what has happened in the last uh, few years, uh, this is actually a very big uh, almost, a, I don't know, I mean, these words are easy to throw around, but it's almost sort of a revolution in some sense because, uh, you know, with the red, uh, you can see the materials that have gone into the, yeah. Uh, sorry to go back, but sure. um, for the full injection and electron injection layers, do they usually use transparent? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they have to be transparent. There is no, uh, yeah, I mean, if it gets real. Even, I mean, even that's not a good idea. I mean, uh, the, because remember, we are going to look at it again today. The light is always, light cannot be confined to the, this region. It always spreads out, and the, a lot of it will get absorbed if you have, don't have transparency. It's very important to be transparent. In fact, the moment you go to heterojunction, you get transparency for free because this region has much smaller gap, and the, the electron and hole injector regions will be larger band gap. And this is one of the beautiful advantages of the double heterostructure. You can have all, a lot of light outside, but it will not get absorbed because the band gap is larger. So yeah. the whole injection and electron injection are actually the three-high? 
Everything is 3 5. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it'll be, for example, uh, let's look at it. This is a, uh, you know, if I look at this structure, sorry, this is gallium nitride, this is gallium nitride, this is indium gallium nitride, smaller band gap. Everything is 3 5 here. Uh, you could make a group 4, uh, you know, silicon junction, but the problem uh, when, when we talk about growth, uh, you know, starting next week or, yeah, starting next week, uh, we will uh, see that. Uh, you know, basically, in principle, you can grow, uh, you know, almost, def it's very hard to grow defect-free 3 fives, first of all, on top of silicon or germanium. If you, even if you can, the interface has a, still a lot of, you know, broken bonds and all that. And, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, there's a lot of recombination and, you know, re non radiative recombination at that interface. What you're thinking probably, I, th I see, is uh, if you have light out and you have an indirect band gap semiconductor, like silicon, then you won't get absorbed. That is correct. And uh, later on, when we talk about integration of 3.5, and uh, so that helps a great deal in a laser structure where, uh, you know, these are called evanescent lasers, right, where you generate light here, but basically most of the light resides in the silicon waveguide underneath, you know, and then you can guide it using silicon. That's what they use for some on-chip optical communications today. Uh, they are, okay, so, uh, but in a heterostructure, you have no issue. I mean, you can increase the band gap and you're good. So. So that's, yeah. a, that's an interband transition that's happening in Yes, yeah. So for, in, uh, for example, here it's still interband, but in a, in a narrow band gap region, in a quantum well. Yeah. And therefore, the light that goes out has the you know, energy of this, this band mm -hmm. gap here. What's the band gap of gallium nitride here? So gallium nitride, an example, is 3.4 eV. And here, this is maybe 2.6 eV. So that will not get absorbed. That's right. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, these regions have to be optically transparent. Otherwise, you know, this, the mean free path is about 100 nanometer, and then the light gets absorbed again. Right? And it will emit again, but at a wavelength that you don't want. And it will be very low efficiency because you know, all that. Yeah. OK, so, so uh, the, uh, I think what I'm saying is uh, this is kind of almost a you know, very big deal now because uh, red, red LEDs had become very efficient. If you look at an oil lamp or you know, light bulbs today, uh, uh, they are you know, and typically 4-5 percent of uh, energy is converted into light uh, and the uh, rest of it is heat. I think, you know, at least in the past, uh, uh, you know, for me, I, uh, when I bought the first laser, uh, for, uh, LED based light bulbs and I was going to change it, uh, the older light bulb and uh, so I had to actually, uh, I think I uh, already, my body reflects is if I, I don't touch a light bulb, right? Because it's, when it's on, it's very hot. These things, I mean, uh, what is very weird because you touch it and there's no temperature. It, it's like room temperature, right? Because the efficiency is so high, you know, and uh, so the efficiency is uh, approaching 50, 60 percent or even higher. I mean, some of the best ones are even higher. Uh, so that's about a one order of, you know, factor of 10 improvement in light conversion efficiency. So, so. Uh, and uh, this is actually a slightly older chart, but uh, even in you know early 2000s, uh, right now uh, the luminous efficiency, meaning how many lumens do you get out for every watt of electrical energy you pump in? You remember, you know there'll be some current that will flow here. That current times this voltage is I times V is some amount of watts that go in, and you can uh, you can measure how much watts of light came out. Right, that's what is labeled in your light bulb, you know, 60 watt, 40 watt, whatever that is. And uh, the efficiency uh, is, is, is this is the efficacy typically number. So anyway, it's it's uh, uh, the white LED is far you know outperformed uh, all the other you know <coughs> competitors uh, in in uh, in the efficiency. So so this is kind of almost a no-brainer for many applications. And uh, uh, the uh, I think you can probably uh, guess that this has uh, a huge impact ba compared to. Uh, you know, uh, so so the, the the energy saving here is absolutely tremendous. It's huge energy savings. You know? So so uh, uh, therefore, uh, I think many countries have already mandated that uh, they are going to phase out uh, light bulbs uh, based on you know the tungsten filament, and they're going to replace. It's it's mandated, or you get some sort of a bonus or whatever, right? So and it makes all sense. And this is one of the big revolutions in three five. Uh, industry and a lot of it was red was already there, but green and blue because of nitrides have made it really possible there. So, so, uh, uh, so, so in our typical white LED, uh, you use basically a single wavelength emitter uh, based on nitrides, and then you down convert using phosphorus. So it doesn't combine red, green, and blue. So, so 
Uh, uh, the other uh, interesting uh, uh, aspect of this uh, uh, story is, is the need for uh, heterojunctions, and uh, this, is, this is really a very uh, important point. Uh, this is a, a, a figure showing, uh, you can um, basically say this is the total uh, efficiency of the LED, what's called the wall plug efficiency for every you know, watt going in, how many watts of light came out. So, so that's the wall plug efficiency. That has obviously buried inside it the internal quantum efficiency and a couple of other things, right? like light extraction and other things. So uh, you, if you do every other thing right, uh, the internal quantum efficiency is, is a typically a material dependent parameter. And what's shown here is for red, you know, gallium arsenide or gallium phosphide based LEDs, uh, 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 if you increase the defect density here, the defect is at this location. You know, it's an extended defect. I think you will cover this in detail. You probably have seen this too. Uh, because of lattice mismatch, you form these defects. Uh, so if you are at 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5 per centimeter square, gallium arsenide LEDs would be dead. Because, why? Because the dislocation is introducing a non-radiative site. It's going to introduce states here and you suck out the electrons and holes and it ends up as heat energy. Okay, so. And so it crashes very fast and very sharply. But, uh, so even for gallium nitride, it crashes very sharply. But the magic material is really the alloy indium gallium nitride, which has a much more robustness to to uh, to the uh, dislocation. Even at 10 to the power 9, uh, per centimeter square dislocation, where everything else is dead, you know, basically all of them are kind of down there, right? This is still emitting light at 40% efficiency, you know, indium gallium nitride. And uh, what's interesting is not, uh, this is a, you know, whenever I, I go to a couple of nitride conferences every year, after 20 years, even today, people haven't completely figured out what's going on with this. You know, the science, the of it is uh, still under debate, but uh, much of it is related. Uh, let me just, uh, uh, I don't think I had the picture, but because when we grow indium gallium nitride, what happens is this material typically does not want to go, down, uh, go very uniformly. You know, they, there's some sort of alloy disorder, meaning the regions which are slightly richer in indium, the regions that are slightly lower in indium, and therefore the band gap starts kind of forming these, uh, you know, modulations. Uh, wherever you have more indium, the band gap will be smaller and all that. So it kind of naturally forms these localized regions where light is created, uh, and these are kind of quantum dots. You know, I mean, essentially, even though you didn't intend it, it has formed quantum dots. These are small regions, and so if, when you inject electrons in holes, they essentially fall into these little puddles or in you know, holes uh, of a small band gap region, and they cannot go back to the defect states. This, they're spatially separated from defects. That's what one of the thoughts why it is so efficient. But this is what I said is true for bulk in the indium gallium nitride. You know, if you had everything is indium gallium nitride or thick indium gallium nitride, the moment you go to quantum wells, you know, you are basically looking at 100%. I mean, there's, there's nothing left. Once you go to quantum wells, that thing is just, you know, 100% quantum efficiency. So, yeah. so, uh, uh, so in gallium arsenide, therefore, you have to work very hard to, to make sure that, uh, you know, you are below, your dislocation densities are below 10 over 5. But in gallium nitride, in fact, most of the LEDs that are in cell phones and you know, many of these applications today, they have about 10 to the power 8 to 10 to the power 9 dislocations today. You know, they are grown on sapphire, you know, no lattice match substrate, uh, but uh, they, there are few quant the few quantum wells in it which essentially just kills this, I mean, removes this problem completely, you know, this particular problem. It's not sensitive very much to dislocations. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so that's just a little detail, uh, uh, and uh, what I'll do now is go into a little deeper into the process of uh, recombination here, and then show, uh, you know, the reason for, for uh, introduction of quantum wells and all that stuff now. Okay, so. uh, actually, right away you can see what a quantum well will do. If I put in one quantum well in this, in, inside this depletion region, uh, let me sketch this. So it will, you know, let's say it's, it's I'm, I'm exaggerating it a little bit, but, you know, let's say I put in a quantum well in this region of certain thickness LW, right? Let's say. So now you see that the quasi Fermi level is here, and quasi Fermi level is here. So the electron density in this region is suddenly gone up by a huge amount. Do you see that? Electron density is suddenly gone up by a huge amount. And, uh, you know, in other words, your Ni squared is proportional to e to the power minus Eg by Kt, right? So you have really jacked this thing up a huge amount, right? Np, right? Therefore, most of the emission 
in this, in, in this whole window, I mean, there's obviously some emission going on here, some here, some there, but really most of it is happening here, a lot of it, right? And that's why this region really dominates. Basically, it's electrostatics and the fact that your Fermi level is now, you know. So uh, the, the way I have drawn it is actually not a LED situation, it's more of a laser situation because here what has happened is these states are filled, I mean, it should be more accurate, there are quantized states, but I'm just kind of skipping that for uh, argument's sake. I fill these states, and these states are empty, right? And, and all the states below that are filled. This is the valence band, right? So what you have gotten now, we are introducing a quantum well and maintaining the Fermi levels, quasi Fermi levels there, is population inversion. This is population inversion. You know, this is filled, this is empty. You see that? I mean, this is obviously, you have inverted the population, and that's the threshold for lasing. So, so, so the quantum wells really make it possible to have low threshold current injection and all that, by, by current injection. Anyway, so it helps both in the light emission LED uh, process for LEDs as well as lasers. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's look at some details of the optical process itself. Okay, so uh, again, uh, I mean, uh, I'll go through this process, uh, uh, this part, uh, in a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, we have discussed things qualitatively, but we'll look at this in a little detail now. So. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, uh, we'll start with the absorption coefficient again, and we want to calculate the absorption coefficient of any semiconductor, and we'll see uh, whatever we develop, the idea will transfer from a bulk material to a quantum well to a wire dot, all that stuff. The idea is the same in the end. So what is the absorption coefficient of any material? It is the you know, uh, uh, number of photons absorbed per unit volume per second, or the rate of absorption of photons per unit volume divided by number of photons that are incident. Absorbed divided by incident, right? Makes sense? I mean, that's simple. And then that's the absorption coefficient. So alpha is absorption coefficient. It depends on the photon energy, h bar omega, is the number of photons absorbed divided by number of photons incident. So let's say uh, per un unit second, so I'll write it as a rate of absorption per unit volume, okay. right? right? Divided by uh, the rate that's incident. And uh, I think uh, the incident part, I'm going to write it in this way, and I think uh, you will agree that uh, you know, for an electromagnetic wave, uh, what is an electromagnetic wave? Well, uh, light uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, has an electric and a magnetic field. So, so it's a, you know, oscillating electric field and an oscillating magnetic field, right? That, that, that you uh, are, are, are very well aware of, so E. Oh, sorry, E cross H, right? So E and H or E and B, whichever way you look at it, and the light moves this way. So it says oscillating electric wave. I've drawn a plane polarized light, you know, linearly polarized. Uh, if you have circularly polarized, then this thing rotates, you know, as you go and all that. It's for simplicity. So, uh, uh, so E and H, and I think you know that uh, uh, the energy transported by this light, uh, by, by this wave, uh, is given by the, what's called the pointing vector, right? The pointing vector, which is uh, uh, given by uh, you know e uh, cross h right and and uh, you know some details to mu and all that but okay this makes sense it's the pointing vector that's the energy transported uh, so say if I put a wall here uh, or, or uh, you know detector here uh, that's how much energy is going through uh, uh, per unit time so actually it's not just energy it's, it's the power that's transported per unit per unit area per unit uh, energy transported per unit area per unit time. And that's exactly what we need in the denominator, except we, want, we don't want the energy, we want the number of photons. Number, right? Let's assume that all these photons have the same wavelength. So it's a laser. Really. Let's assume that all the same wavelength. In that case, uh, uh, all of them have the energy of h bar omega, right? where that's, omega is the frequency, and corresponding c by lambda is the wavelength. Right? So, so uh, in that case, Basically, S over h bar omega, I think you would agree, is the number of photons that is incident on the sample per unit area per unit time. Right. Simple enough, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, and what is S? Uh, so, your electric field in an in a, uh, electromagnetic wave is, you know, some, let's say, some vector potential. I mean, we don't need to worry about it. It's some coefficient times sine omega t, kx minus omega t. The magnetic field is kind of the curl of that, so it's, you know, essentially it remains, uh, it becomes, basically the pointing vector becomes sine square of all these quantities. The end result of all that is like, it's, it goes as square of electric field, obviously, you know, it's the intensity. 
uh, and uh, uh, so, so the pointing uh, vector uh, in the end uh, uh, will look like what's written there. And let me just write that down. The refractive index of the semiconductor, uh, speed of light, dielectric permittivity of vacuum, the frequency of light squared times uh, what's written there is A naught squared. And let me explain that part. A naught is the vector potential. Uh, and uh, let me just say that uh, electric field is a uh, uh, you know, rate of change of the vector potential. Essentially, if vector potential is A times some sine omega t, electric field is in magnitude, that's what we are really interested in, is omega uh, A naught, you know, so, so uh, of vector potential. So essentially, what we are saying here is this is just the amplitude of electric field squared. That, that, that's your point. That's, that's just the numerator, the pointing vector absolute value. And then you divide the whole thing by h bar omega, right? Uh, and, and this is your uh, denominator point. This was sitting in the denominator. Yeah. And you can calculate it depending upon your intensity and all that. But important point is it goes as the square of the amplitude of the vector potential or electric field or magnetic field, whichever, right? So that's how much light is incident on, uh, uh, you know, uh, on this piece of semiconductor now. Uh, uh, per unit area, per unit time. Uh, and, and now the question is, uh, uh, how much came out here is obviously, uh, um, you know, whatever is incident minus whatever got absorbed. So we are looking at what is the absorption. So the absorption is where we look, want to look at the process, the microscopic process of transition here now. So, and the inverse of that is the, obviously the emission process, right? Is that clear? So pointing vector tells you. And, and uh, given uh, you know, if you have your laser, uh, you turn it on, you say, well, I have, you know, this much uh, um, 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 milliwatt or uh, something per centimeter square. You, that's exactly what you're talking about. You know, if your laser light source has, you know, one milliwatt per centimeter square output, it's basically the S. That's the S we're talking about. And then from there, if you know the wavelength of laser, obviously, you know, the, if you made a laser, you know its wavelength. Yeah, you can plug in all quantities and, and figure out what, what this quantity is now, right? Make sense? Yes. The only unknown is really the E naught. So you can everything else is known here, the frequency and the wavelength and all that. Okay, so now this light hits the photon hits a semiconductor, and uh, what does it do, right? So so we want to now look at the numerator. What is this? The rate of absorption. <coughs> uh, all right, so let's uh, look at that one. So when it, uh, um, it's a semiconductor, we're going to look at a semiconductor that uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, initially we're going to think of it as uh, in equilibrium. And uh, the semiconductor has a band structure. And so this is your conduction band. Uh, this is energy of K and K. And this is your valence band, EV. Of k, so we are talking about the band structure now, right? E k diagram, right? And uh, uh, I think you can see uh, what we'll do is we just, just for argument's sake, we're going to label this as zero, and therefore this becomes the band gap, right? In, in, the, in that scale, energy scale, and any state here, let's say there is a state here, and you remember that you know in k space, if you are in three D semiconductor, you have a three D k grid, right? K x, k y, k z. Similarly, K grid for valence band and all that stuff, right? So there is a state here, let's say, for electrons, which is uh, available, uh, and, and let's say that state is empty, and you know we have a state. Uh, let's actually draw one here. It's empty state and one here. This is filled, and that photon that comes in, right, can. Uh, a kick, uh, if the energy is exactly matched, it can kick this electron into that state, right? right? So, so the electron uh, in the valence, valence band can absorb the photon and go there, right? And then the photon vanishes. There's no more photon. Right? So it gets absorbed, right? So, uh, so for that process to occur, you immediately see that the energy must be conserved. So let's write that down. Now, how can energy be conserved, right? In that case, you see the energy of the conduction band electron is equal to the band gap plus this thing here, right? And what is this thing? How do you write that? You know, this little extra energy here. This is the kinetic energy of the electron, right? And what is that? Right. K 
squared by 2 times the effective mass of the conduction band, m star c. Similarly, the valence band state here, this state here, you can see will be Ev of k will be basically 0 minus this little slice right in this in the scale that we have chosen so this is basically minus h square the same k squared by 2 times m star of v valence band right does it make sense okay so what is the energy conservation law it says that you know this minus this must be equal to h bar omega very simple right but the moment you do that you get something very useful and sometimes you know, non-intuitive almost. So you get Eg, you can see that this minus this will be, you know, Eg plus this plus this because there's a negative sign. So obviously you're adding them. So what you end up getting is a square, k square by 2, but the m is a parallel sum of the two, two bands. They get mixed up. So, so the conduction and valence bands get mixed up now. So, and this quantity is 1 over m star is called the reduced effective mass or it's a joint effective mass of both conduction and valence band m star r and that's your uh, 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 requirement of energy i mean energy conservation requirement okay. is that clear okay so uh, you can write this now as uh, uh, you can turn this around and write as h square k square by 2 times the reduced effective mass must be equal to h bar omega minus eg right and what does this this equation is actually extremely important because what it's telling you is the following it's telling you that look when you have a photon of a certain energy that's incident on this material not all k transitions will occur if i have electron here or there this transition is not possible only some k's are allowed. Right? What k's are allowed? The k's that satisfy this equation. Make sense? Yeah. Right? So these are the only allowed transitions optically for this pro process now. Right? And therefore, you have a lot of k states, right? but you know, uh, only a very small fraction of them or, or, or a fraction of them are going to allow for, absor will absorb the light, right? only a part of them. Right? And so to find uh, remember the question we are asking is what is the total rate of absorption to find the uh, so for each absorption process you will have a certain rate okay? uh, and then you have to sum it over all such possible k's to find the total rate sum it over all possible rates okay? so uh, you can see that you know uh, this looks the problem looks very much like a density of states problem if I ask you how many states are allowed you know here right it's like a very, it's a photo, it's a K state counting problem, same, same thing, very similar thing. And what we'll get when you actually solve this problem is, is the following. And I, I'm, uh, this is a point where I'm going to actually uh, not, uh, uh, I'll just point this out because, uh, you know, we are obviously not doing the quantum aspect of the story in detail. But the absorption rate, the total absorption rate, is equal to the rate of absorption, let's say, of each k state. Let's say this is the rate of absorption for each k state <coughs> times the occupation function that the valence band is the occupation function of the valence band. This obviously has to be occupied, right? Right? And minus uh, uh, this has to be unoccupied too, right? Sorry, this has to be unoccupied. This has to be occupied for this process to occur. So you must get one minus. Uh, you know, you will have something like that. Does that make sense? What I'm writing? Valence band must be occupied. Conduction band must be empty for this process to occur. And there is a you know a transition rate probability which is dependent on matrix elements and all that. But anyway, what you end up doing is the total absorption rate will be a sum of a certain quantity which is a coefficient of rates times occupation functions. This is all the processes that are kind of going up. You know, optically. You know, kind of going up. Uh, roughly, I mean, does that make sense what I'm writing? I'm not doing this in, in great detail at this point. But what I wanted to say is this quantity here, this rate, is uh, this is given by a transition rule, I mean, the Fermi Golden Rule in quantum. And it depends on, again, there's energy conservation rule. But then you have the matrix element between the two states. So let's say you know the wave function of the valence band state, wave function of the conduction band state. 
then uh, this quantity here uh, will be given by uh, 2 pi over Planck's constant times the wave function of the valence band state, wave function of the conduction band state. And what will sit in between, and this is basically comes from the fact that light uh, or electromagnetic wave enters quantum mechanics and all that through through uh, uh, the vector potential and all that. But you know the details of that is not as important as the fact that you have a r or you can write it equivalently with a uh, length or radius uh, or the distance or you can write it in terms of a momentum you know r or p they're equivalent i mean they're related through the uncertain relation anyway so there's some detail there but this is where the symmetry argument comes in this is where the symmetry argument comes in so what it's saying is uh, let's just simplify it and instead of r write as x for simplicity so uh, what it's saying is it's a product uh, this quantity here uh, all right, and so the total term is E valence minus E conduction plus minus H bar omega and all that details of some energy conservation. So this is the matrix element that enforces the symmetry of it. Uh, the matrix element is you take uh, dx valence band, conduction band, star, and then you multiply it with x. This, this quantity is, is uh, uh, you know, this matrix element. So this is why, you know, uh, for example, for this interband, I mean, they, they, they must have uh, some, one of the things must, uh, so remember, uh, for a bulk material, uh, these, these uh, will have S or P orbital states, and so one of them has to be odd or even depends, all of that depends on this term, whether it's allowed or not. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm not getting into more details than what I just said here yeah, for this problem. Yeah. But what I'll say, though, is once you do this, uh, sum and all that, and you sum over all these allowed k states, what the result you get is very intuitive and actually it's very simple in the end, all, all, after all the dust settles. The end result of it is that, you know, the, that the absorption coefficient is, you know, all, this whole sum and all that, take, take all the sum. What, sum over all k's, what k's, k's that allow this. So you get, uh, the, the end result of that is uh, that the, uh, the absorption coefficient will be equal to, <coughs> again, some coefficients out in the front times what we're going to call as the reduced density of states. Reduced density of states or sometimes also referred to as a joint density of states. Optical density of states, joint density of states, all kinds of stuff. Why is it uh, called that way? It's because it has information about light and matter. You know, matter has created the band gap, so it's a combined thing. You know, it has uh, properties of photons, it has properties of electrons and holes through effective masses and the band gap. It has properties of all of them are jo joined together in the same density of states. So the earlier density of states we evaluated were the conduction band density of states only for electrons. There were, there were no photons involved there, right? And all that. This is a process which involves both uh, light and you know electrons and the uh, crystal. Therefore, it has all the all of this in it, uh, sitting in it. And what is the uh, expression for it? It's actually very simple. You remember, uh, in in uh, for a three D uh, electron density of states, uh, uh, we had written, for example, it was like one over I forget two pi squared or something like that, m star. If you're looking at the conduction band, let's say, right, over eight square, three halves square root of E minus EC, right? Remember we had derived this. This, this was the 3D density of states of only electrons in the conduction band. And what's very nice is after all this dust settles here, the expression for the joint density of states is pretty much exactly the same. There's no difference. Except, obviously there has to be a difference, right? Obviously there's a difference. What's the difference? The energy, I think you can see it, is going to become that. It is H bar omega minus EG. Changes to that. Effective mass, I think you also kept, might have guessed it, will become the reduced effective mass because of, you know, that's it. There's no, nothing, everything else in the expression, you can just carry over the density of states from whatever you had done before, right? So, okay. But now you see how nice, it has nicely tied in uh, the aspect that light is interacting with matter. So if you choose a compound semiconductor, you know, gallium arsenide, indium gallium nitride, you know the band gap, you know the effective masses and all that, you can now just plug it in and calculate your absorption coefficient. Right? So, make sense? Okay. So, uh, so th these are the expressions for it. Uh, this is the joint density of states and all that. And uh, I have uh, actually not much time left today, so what I'll do is just uh, point out 
Why did we spend so much time talking about this? Uh, what we calculated right now is what's called the uh, 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 you know, equilibrium absorption coefficient. And let me explain what that is. Okay. So if you had a semiconductor where the valence band is completely filled, Fv, valence band, occupation function of valence band states is 1. And all the conduction band states were empty. Fc, uh, this is the Fermi occupation function of the conduction band is 0. Okay. What we calculated here, you know, that, that it is equal to this, is true if my semiconductor was sitting like that. Okay. If, I mean, if it was under, uh, uh, not only under equilibrium, but at 0 Kelvin. Because at 0 Kelvin, this is true, right? The moment you turn on the temperature, then Fv of k, uh, there's some Ni squared, you know, this thermal generation right away, right? So, so at 0 Kelvin, at least, this is true. So this is the 0 Kelvin absorption coefficient. Take a semiconductor, do absorption coefficient measurement with light at 0 Kelvin, this is what you'll measure. And you look at the density of states, uh, sorry, the absorption coefficient, you can see right now that alpha 0 of h bar omega, uh, you know, because of, it's very clear why it starts at band gap, right? And if you are in 3D, it's going to go like that, right? The square root of energy with, with the, you know, the slope or a curvature here depending on masses and all that. If you are in 2D, you know, it's going to go like that. If you're in a quantum well, for example, it's a two-dimension, right? Quasi two-dimension, it's going to go like that, but it won't stop here because there may be higher subbands, so it will go like that again and like that. That's the joint optical density of states now. The minimum here will not be the band gap of the quantum well, but it will be plus, you know, whatever is the quantum confinement in the conduction band, right? You see, I mean, the minimum energies are pushed up, and valence bands are pushed down, so there'll be a little bit of a delta uh, because of quantum confinement, right? Does that make sense? The minimum is there. Then you hit the first subband, the second, and all that, all, all that sort of stuff, right? But uh, let me uh, actually let's skip one of these slides. So just as an order of magnitude of absorption coefficient, it's of the order of 10 to the power of 5 inverse centimeter. We had talked about this long time ago as well. You know, 10 to the power of 5 inverse centimeter for most compound semiconductors. And it depends on effective masses, et cetera, et cetera, and all that. But uh, uh, all that it means is uh, uh, 1 over the absorption coefficient is kind of the optical abs absorption length. You know, that's how far light will. Remember, e to the power minus absorption coefficient times distance is the decay of light, right? So that's how, how much it gets absorbed. But what I wanted to end today was uh, by saying is uh, what happens. Obviously, in a LED or a laser, we are not interested in a material sitting at 0 Kelvin and doing nothing, right? We are going to inject a lot of carriers now, right? We're going to pull it way out of equilibrium. Right? And that's how we're going to get it to emit light. So what we need to do for... Uh, for a non-equilibrium situation is to reevaluate it under non-equilibrium. I mean, wonder when Fc is not equal to, uh, you know, when, when, when Fc and Fv are not equal to, you know, 1 and 0, right? But they are something, right? And what is amazing is even after you do that, the expression remains very simple. You know? And here's the expression. The absorption coefficient under non-equilibrium is equal to absorption coefficient at 0 Kelvin at equilibrium times a difference of Fermi functions. You know? the difference of Fermi functions. And uh, let me just uh, write that down and, and end the class here today because uh, uh, this, the, 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 and, and this expression is at the heart of all you know, optical devices. So the net non-equilibrium absorption coefficient is equal to the net absorption coefficient at equilibrium times the Fermi function of the valence band at a particular k naught minus Fermi function of conduction band at a particular at the same K naught. What is that K naught? That K naught is a unique quantity determined by the light, h bar omega photon energy, the semiconductor band gap, and the effective mass. Uniquely determined. Once you choose your semiconductor, K naught is clamped. It's fixed. So, so what you do is so this is basically just square root of two reduced mass over h bar squared, h bar omega minus e g. So you take your Fermi function. What is the Fermi function? For the valence band, it is 1 over 1 plus E to the power, you know, the valence band energy minus quasi-Fermi level, not equilibrium Fermi level anymore, but quasi-Fermi level of poles, the valence band over K2. And 
Similarly, for electrons or conduction band, it will be 1 over 1 plus e to the power ec of k minus. I'm not derived, I've obviously not derived these, but I at least have pointed out and, and uh, what, what, where they came from. So you get this, and uh, uh, what we'll do is just stop here, but just to point it out, the moment fv of k, if fv of k is greater than fc of k, what does that mean? It means if valence band states are more occupied than conduction band states, right? Uh, alpha is positive, right? Right? And, and it remains like there is absorption in the material. But the moment fv of k becomes larger than fc of k, alpha goes negative. Right? And that means the absorption coefficient has become negative. Okay? When is fv of k larger than fc of k? Here's a picture. You know, fv is occupation function, so, so here, if your Fermi level is here, the occupation function of this state with an electron is zero. There's no electron here. Right? And that is one at the same k. Right? So you get zero minus one, so you get a negative of minus alpha naught. Make sense? Okay? And that, that is basically what we're going to do in the next class and then connect it to lasers. Basically, here's the absorption coefficient. And as you inject carriers, you'll get a little window over which you will have a negative absorption coefficient. And that's when you have optical gain for every you know, five photons coming in, there will be six or seven going out. You know? So that's the optical gain medium. It, it will amplify light uh, uh, through this process. Okay? So uh, we'll, we'll discuss this in the next class, and I think uh, uh, finished up the discussion on lasers and connected to lasers here, okay? uh, on uh, uh, Tuesday, next week. And uh, so there were some questions about uh, the exams. And by the way, there will be an assignment posted this weekend. Uh, we're kind of finishing up this discussion. and. Uh, there are questions on exams and such, so I'll e email something out, okay? And uh, uh, I'll send out send out an email over the next couple of days.